Let's stand together right now as we continue on in our series. It's time you quit as we go through the book of Romans 8. It's time you quit. We're talking about, if you uh, haven't been here, we're talking about leaving off, getting away from, quitting. Any religious approach to God, works-based legalism, approaching God. You will not have it. You will not have none of it. God is a person. He's a personality. He requires such of you to be the person that you are. Listen, Jesus Christ died for your sins. He didn't die for your personality. In our insecurity, we always want to be somebody else. And I think that's an insult to God. I really do. You don't need to be somebody else. God made you who you are. Here's the deal. What are you going to do with who you are? Are you going to give yourself to God? Are you going to fully surrender to him? Are you going to understand that quitting your own pursuits and giving them to God and living for him is the exact answer for your life? It's that very thing for which you were created. He died for our sins, but he wants to take the very person of who you are and his Holy Spirit wants to indwell you, which AI could never do, and use you both to his glory and to your pleasure. We know this as we read this together, that God is speaking. I'll pick up in verse 12, as you guys know, pick it up in verse 13, the odd numbers. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. We are in debt, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. The Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit himself, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Father, we pray that you would continue to teach us out of this word, its deep theology, just the structure alone, a remarkable word usage by the apostle, ultimately, of course, by the Holy Spirit. God, give us an understanding, give us an ability to learn this, and then, Lord, most importantly, after we've learned it, to do it. So God, please inhabit this worship, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated, church. Romans chapter 8, the Magna Carta of New Testament theology, and it is deep. The Apostle Paul often, when he was speaking, especially to non-believing crowds, like he did at Caesarea, uh, where when he's speaking Bible doctrine, uh, there are those who get it, and there are those who do not get it. And um, that's something to always keep in mind. When You may be visiting today, or maybe you've stepped into this place for the first time. Maybe you're searching. Uh, Just know this. You can't have church without having true biblical doctrine be the governing power of what is church. The church is built on doctrine. And because it is, the church is the ground and pillar, the Bible says, of all truth. Isn't that a tremendous statement? Paul told that to Timothy. The church is the ground and the pillar of all truth. It's not that the church is right. It's that if the church is rooted on biblical doctrine, the church will be right. This is a great lesson for all of us. You don't need to worry about what's trending. You don't need to be worried about what's happening or what somebody's thinking. If you know as a believer that what you're standing on is biblical truth, you will not only be effective, listen, you'll also be prophetic. Because God knows, as he leads you, that if you are rooted and grounded in Bible doctrine, then you are always going to be relevant. You won't have to change. How many times have you seen ministers of the gospel uh, where they constantly have to update or change their, their narrative because they've gone with emotion or they've gone with trends? How many pastors did we see during the... BLM movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, make a big mistake with that one. 
Be it COVID, be it politics, be it church dynamics, be it whatever it might be. When you are licking your finger and testing the wind to see what direction the church ought to go, you're at sea without a rudder. But if you understand the Bible, which never changes, the world around us appears to be changing. Just know this. It appears to be changing. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. When we are anchored to the word of God, the storm of hurricane might be around us, but we will be as a pillar. Why? It's not us. It's the ground we're standing on. And that ground is Bible doctrine. That's why in verses 12 to 14, we saw regarding it's time you quit to just do something or don't just do something. We need to stop acting and actually stand still and see the work of God. We can get so busy in religion that we saw three things, that the counter to being religious, which is checking in and checking out of the service, I've done my time, here's my Bible uh, scorecard, I went to church these many weeks out of the year, no, stop that. What we wanna do is know this, and we learned it already, and that is in verses 12 to 13, that we are actually in God's debt. We are no longer in debt to the things of this world, which led to us standing in his life. Because we are now indebted to God, we stand and live in his life. And then thirdly, we saw last time, it is this, and that is we stand in his family, that we are in the family of God. And uh, that's where we uh, left off uh, in that argument. Look at verse 14, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And I mentioned to you just in the closing last time that as many, it means those who are. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. Meaning you. If that's your desire that God lead your life. Now look, everybody, this place is packed out right now. God bless you for coming to church so early. That's wonderful. But let me ask you, don't, don't respond. Do you crave? Do you long to have your life be led by the Spirit of God as being a child of God, meaning this. And I'm trying to control myself right now. But I mean it, because I'm, I'm, I'm asked this question every week. People come to me and they say, Pastor Jack, and I get it, I get it. And every church in California hears the same thing. Pastor Jack, we're moving, we can't take it. Gavin Newsom's a tyrant. Uh, we're moving. And then the next question they ask me is, uh, we're moving to uh, Timbuktu or something. <laughs> Do you know a good church? <laughs> listen, listen. What are you moving for if you haven't found a church yet? Oh, the money's better. The government's better. I don't care if there's a pot of gold at the end of that perceived rainbow. If there's no unified work of the Spirit speaking to that husband and the wife together, how can, the Bible says in Amos 3.3, how can two walk together in less than agreement? Listen, you can move to paradise. If God didn't tell you to go there, you're in trouble. I'm here to tell you, listen, I would rather be right in the middle of the will of God with bullets flying and uh, Newsome on the throne than to be out of the will of God. Listen, are you being led by the Spirit of God? Those who are the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God desires to lead us. And a family asked me last week, uh, they, they, listen, when people make the declaration, I never, I never touch it. When they say, we're moving, where should we go? I say, I have no answer for you. Look, I may be ugly, but I'm not dumb. You don't ever step into that one. You want to know why? Because if they go away and it doesn't go well, then I'm to blame. And I, I'm not going to do that. No, listen, if God is leading him, you pick, sir, you pick up the Bible by yourself, study the Bible, read, 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 pray, ask God to speak to you. Listen, wife, you pick up the Bible, you read, 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 ask God to speak to you. And when both of you come together and say, I think the Lord has been saying this to me. Listen, if you're in agreement, second thing is, Find out where there's a Bible teaching church in that country or in that state that you're going to. 
Don't get ahead of God. When you're led by the Spirit of God, you will not get ahead of Him. And the human nature is prone to get ahead of God. We're in a family, and God is at work. The Bible here, there, here in verse 14 says that we are led. Look at that word led. It's an amazing word, and I'll put it on the screen for you. To bring along, I like that. To bring along, to carry along. I like that picture. The Holy Spirit wants to bring you along, carry you along. The word means to travel with or alongside another. I really like that. By the way, has anyone ever read or seen the manifestations through cartoons or whatever of Pilgrim's Progress? It's beautiful because Pilgrim's Progress, written by John Bunyan, is really all about this. Being led by God comes alongside you. Firstly, to be in session, the word means. Secondly, to be in class or as a learner. Or third, an apprentice. Fourth, we have the word disciple. God, the Holy Spirit, wants to lead you in life. It's not a mystery. You say, Jack, it's so hard for me. Listen, it's hard for us when we're not in the word listening for him to speak. Then yes, it is hard for us. And by the way, with all due respect, he loves you so much, he'll let it be hard for you. He won't make it hard. You and I make it hard. He just says, you want to drive down that road? Yeah, yeah, I do. He, sa he says, well, you just go ahead. I'm going to wait right here. And then when you come back and your teeth are all knocked out and you've got a bruised forehead and uh, it's been a rough day, he says, now, are, are you ready to quit now? And uh, go on the, the path that I'm showing you? Yes, sir. He wants to lead you because we're in a family. And by the way, it's a continuous leading. I take pleasure in this. The very theology is that the Holy Spirit wants to lead you forever. Every day. That none of us get up and go and live the day alone, on our own, without help. Oh, he's there. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 10, the Bible says, Jesus said, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. I love that passage because Jesus is resurrected from the dead. People are freaking out, not knowing what to do. And Jesus says, I'm going ahead to Galilee. Tell everybody I'll meet them there. 80, get on your donkey, go 88 miles north out of Jerusalem. Let's blow this town. I'll meet you in the country. I love it. He's leading them. Psalm 23, verse 2. 23rd Psalm, verse 2. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Watch. He leads me beside still waters. He leads. Know today, church, that God wants to lead you personally in your life. This should be a game changer for some of us. If God wants to lead us, and if I just take the time to listen, then I don't need to go through all of the bumps and bruises of life that I could experience if I do it on my own. This is true. Listen, we're all sinners. None of us are perfect, but I can tell you this. When you wait upon the Lord, he will lead you. We need to learn to wait. Sometimes it drives you nuts. Sometimes it drives me nuts. But when we, when we wait upon God until he answers, it may take some time. Maybe not. Could be an hour. Could be a year. Could be longer. You say, Jack, don't talk like that. The outcome is confidence and peace. He's in it. Have you ever been called to something by God and it's very difficult? God called you to maybe be at that job or to be at that thing or be involved in that ministry and it's hard. Somebody told me just before service today, I never knew that signing up for ministry would be so much filled with spiritual warfare. Now you say, Jack, I can hear all the ministry leaders saying, don't say that. We need help more. We need more help. No, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I think you can take it. Uh, we're not playing games here. The Bible's real. God is real. Christ died. Christ rose again from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, he's real. And because he's real, the enemy's real. And there's a war. And if you want to pretend to be a Christian... That's on you. But if you want to be a Christian, just know this. The enemy's going to oppose you. And what a blessed battle that is. 
It brings me great confidence to be opposed by the enemy. Enemy doctrine, enemy views, enemy positions that are an affront to God. It's not personal. Remember that. We talked about that a few weeks ago. It's not personal. When somebody's going after God, you should get caught in the middle. That's, that's my calling in life. When somebody attacks God, I should get caught in the middle of that. If somebody shoots God, then I should have that wound on me. That's part of the ministry. Oh, but it's part of the glory. There's a day coming when God will make it all right. In Psalm 23, verse 4, Yea, though I walk, remember, you're not alone. Through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Is that, listen, is that true, really? If that's absolutely true, then why is our nation gripped with fear? The answer is, they don't know God. This reality will will result in a passionate willingness, I believe, for you and I to yield to the authority of God. Yes, Lord, you lead. Here, take the wheel. You lead. You drive. And being led by the Spirit, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. Let me tell you what being led by the Spirit does not mean. I wrote some things down for myself because a lot of people use terminology as a cloak to get their own way. Things like this. This is what it doesn't mean. Are you with me, everybody? It doesn't mean this. I prayed about it, and I believe that this is what the Lord is saying to me. Okay, uh, you've prayed about it and you believe this is what the Lord is saying to you, so watch this. That sounds great. Where's the scripture that backs that up? As a believer, I walk in scripture. You ought to be able to come to me and say, why are you doing this, Pastor Jack? And I ought to be able to turn to chapter verse and say, right here. You know, I just believe that God wants me happy. You know there's books on this right now. There's big Christian books for sale right now on this issue. I just believe God wants me happy. Where'd you read that? How about this? God wants you joyful. That's that's a big difference. Because if God wants you happy, I got news for you. Newsflash is when bad stuff happens, you're going to think God abandoned you. We're not, listen, we're not happy all the time. But you can have joy all the time. So be careful. When the Spirit's leading, it's not that he's going to speak to you something that is, you've already predetermined, and he's not going to speak to you something that is contrary to Scripture. Never. He can't do it. He can't lie against his own word because he can't lie. He's the Holy Spirit. But I want to point out what being led by the Spirit does look like. This is fun stuff. You're going to want to write this down. Psalm 33, verse 6. I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff here. Psalm 33, verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. See how strong the Bible is? That makes the Bible of the authority. The word of God. And all the host of them, by the breath of his mouth, the starry sky, He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. I love that. Verse 9. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. That means he spoke creation out of nothing and there it was. It stood fast. When I, hear, when I hear that, it stood fast, I see Jupiter hanging out there on nothing. You know, there's some religions, I won't mention their names right now, uh, they're very popular. They believe right now that the earth is going through the universe on the back of a gigantic turtle. <laughs> Look it up. No, no, no turtle. The Bible says, by the way, listen, The Bible says he has suspended the sphere, the circle of the world he has hung in space upon nothing. That sphere, not disc, not flat, listen, flatties. 
No, round. It's round. Chris Columbus figured that one out a long time ago. We shouldn't, shouldn't worry about that. It's round. And God says, by my word, it hangs in space. Nothing holds it up. Isn't that awesome? I love that. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, so stop listening to dumb friends who don't know God, <laughs> nor stands in the path of sinners. Stay away from people that are going to ruin your life. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Bitter, ugly people don't have anything to do with them. Just move on. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. This is God's will for your life. Put him first. He wants to lead you. It's part of him being our head, as it were, of the family. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. 2 Peter 1, 19 begins, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to take heed to as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy that is utterance of scripture is of any private interpretation. You can't make things up. Well, the Bible says this, and I think and I believe it means this. No, no, the Bible says what it says and it backs itself up. Why? That's how God leads us. The Bible, the Bible, the word of God. The more you read it, the more guidance you have. The more leading you'll hear. Hebrews chapter six, verse one. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. These are, these are fundamental basics we move on from. We already know all this. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so God willing we will move forward to further understanding. God wants to lead you. Watch everybody, where you're at today, where I'm at today, God wants to lead us into a deeper walk. Amen. Now, I'm gonna say this, and I'm talking to people who have been, I'm just, if you've been Christian for, uh, a Christian for 30 years or more, I wanna, I wanna speak this to you, because I'm with you on this one. In some ways, our walk with Jesus gets easier as the years go on. In other ways, it gets harder. It gets harder because we can become complacent assuming that this is what he's going to do. And I've often said we want to be very careful that we don't get old as a Christian, but as we spend more time with Christ, we become more childlike in our faith and relationship with him. All for this reason. The goal for the seasoned saint is to keep that relationship fresh. Look, you know it's true. How many of you have been married for over 40 years? Raise your hands. Listen, to keep your marriage, listen, it's, a, it's, listen, it's, it's awesome to get your marriage to that point and it's more awesomer <laughs> To continue on from that point, because listen, you got you got to think about it. You got to you, you got to keep it uh, sparky. You got to keep it. Man, the last thing you want to do is say, "Oh, good morning." Uh, hey, good morning. How many years? I don't know. Yeah, me. Yeah, I don't know. No, no, you don't want to do that. Listen, everybody, especially single people, listen up. You want to be married to the person that God wants you to be married to so that when you've been married 40 plus years, that it gets better because you work at it. You have to think of new ways of like, hey, how do we keep this fresh? Let's do something crazy. Lisa and I did something crazy. We put on our robes and we drove to Jack in the Box and got those, um, talk, those tacos that only God knows what's inside of them. Let's... Let's be honest. I, I just, I take it, don't ask, don't tell. Just eat it. And so now in our minds, it's that, do you remember when we drove through Jack in the Box in our robes? 
Don't tell anybody that. And don't tell Lisa that. She's not here right now. She'll come to second service. So when the Holy Spirit is not leading, we have a tendency to lean on other people's experiences. When the Holy Spirit is not leading, we tend to try to mimic somebody that uh, we might be impressed by. When the Holy Spirit is not leading, we will seem to fumble from one mistake to the next. But when the Holy Spirit is leading, we will walk in that path. God will prosper the way in which we are going. Because why? Matthew 6, says, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these other things shall be added to you. It's beautiful. Psalm 32, verse 8. I told you I was going to give you a lot of scriptures on this point. This is very, very important, especially if you have young people in your life. Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I love that. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near. God says, what a great verse. That's so amazing. I want to lead you with my eye, God says. Come on, let's go with my eye. I'm leading you. Versus dragging a donkey along. Why should we yield? 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, that's a huge statement. People will say, that's a, you know what, Pastor, you're not helping. You're just, you're making a Bible claim to back up a Bible claim. Oh, no, you've misread something, my friend. The Bible makes a claim, and then because it does make the claim, the burden on, is on you to disprove it. For example, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. The evidence is overwhelming. If you don't like that, then disprove it. God says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All of the Bible's been breathed out by the Holy Spirit. Well, don't believe that. If you don't believe it, prove it wrong. Because there is what is known as the consistency or the expositional consistency, the integrity of the Bible. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. Well, that's a beautiful statement. Nobody can deny that the Bible teaches you how you ought to live. By the, by the way, can I say this sarcastically? That's what's wrong with the Bible. People don't want it to tell them how to live. I want to do what I want to do. So keep your Bible to yourself. They don't want any manifestation of Christians, the Bible, or the Ten Commandments anywhere. Why? Because it makes them feel bad. Why? Because they're on their own course. And they know that they're not walking in his righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what happens when he leads us. So we want to ask ourselves, are we being led by the Holy Spirit? Listen to this powerful verse, Psalm 107, verse 19. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of all their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Is God your father? Is God your family head in your household? I sure hope so. Regarding spiritual development, by the way, it's certainly the greatest exercise that we can possibly experience as Christians. Everything I'm encouraging you to do in the reading of these verses is to exercise your heart and your brain and your mind to do God's will. You got to flex it and all this stuff. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' fables. Oh, isn't that great? <laughs> Instead, train yourself to be godly. This is hard work. I'm telling you, you want to work out? I want to work out, man. Okay, that's great. Go ahead and work out. But you want to really work out? Like, yeah, what do you have in mind? Discipline your life in spiritual development. 
I'll submit to you, it's very, very hard. Look, 40 years ago, I used to work out. <laughs> Wait, that's not true. I, uh, I've been married 43, 44 years, 43, 40, oh no. <laughs> I've been married 44, 43 years. And it uh, doesn't matter, the moment I met Lisa, I stopped going to the gym. I, I'm as honest, I'm, why? Because, because I didn't want to waste my time. She probably wished I would have gone to the gym, but I didn't. I wanted to be with her when I had the time. And um, that was a long time ago. I can tell you, yeah, getting up at four o'clock in the morning and going to the gym and working out and, and you, you, you're not too motivated unless you have a partner, then you know they're going to be there. So now you got to be there. And then once you get there, uh, people are working out and pride kicks in. Pride says, hey, that guy's arms are bigger than yours. You need to work on that. So you're, you're working on your biceps or that guy, hey, that guy can bench press more than you. So now you start bench pressing. It's all, it's all carnal. I get it. But the Bible says, you know what? Physical exercise profits a little bit. The Bible says, don't, it, it doesn't say don't do it. It just says, know this. You're going to pull a muscle. <laughs> it doesn't say pull a muscle, but it says it profits for a little bit. But there's a spiritual exercise that profits forever. And that's what I'm supposed to be reading to you right now. <laughs> train yourself to be godly. Verse 8, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Like, can you imagine how many buff people there are in hell because they forgot to do the latter part? <laughs> hell could be filled with a bunch of people that are all buffed out but they never got into the spiritual matter of things. It's not a problem getting buffed out, but get buffed out first in the spirit. Yeah. Know your Bible, know doctrine, know why you have a life. What are you doing with it? And then listen, if you have the time, go do a sit up or two. <laughs> he says that this is a promise with benefits in this life and in the life to come. Verse nine, this is a worthy saying and Everyone should accept it. What a great statement that is. But it's all about us being led by the Spirit of God. The Bible says these are the sons of God. Are you led by the Holy Spirit? That's what you want to ask yourself. And by the way, look at the word sons. This is sons regarding us, not sons like God. God has one son. That's Jesus Christ. When we are his children, there's an affectionate term here, as you're going to discover, where we are called sons. Now, in this day and age of, of people being offended over everything, uh, the word, you know, that, uh, you know the word man, like uh, we, created, uh, we created these uh, health things to, to help man. Does, do people know today what that means? Do you know it has nothing to do with men it has to do with, with man. Man means mankind or humankind, okay? When the word says sons, someone's going to say, it should have said daughters. Where's daughters? <laughs> Don't worry about it. It means male, female, us who believe. Amen. By the way, in Christ Jesus, there's no rich or poor, slave or free, male or female. We're all one in Christ, Amen. which is cool. Anyway, it means a descendant as a son by birth or by adoption. We're going to learn this in a moment about adoption. To possess our own sonship, to share in the same nature as the father, implying that a son of God is one who has been adopted and has experienced the legal right to be, that is, reborn into the family of God through faith in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Now that latter end in the, in the parentheses is simply explaining it in a Christian context. Back up a moment though. One who has been adopted and has experienced legal right to be. That's a clause from first century Rome. This is absolutely amazing. Mark this down. It's verses 15 to 16 and it's this. Don't just talk about it, say it. Don't just talk about it, say it. You say, what do you mean by that? Look at verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. 
You didn't come out of religion and become a partner in some new religion that is crippling and somehow uh, keeps you bound. No, not at all. But you receive the spirit of adoption. Notice the liberty. It's a remarkable statement. You've been freed by adoption. By whom we cry out or the source, because, listen, because the adoption is true in our lives, we with meaning call him Abba. Everybody listen, this is a big church, there's a big streaming audience, there's a big television audience, and for me, uh, to offend someone in this next statement is highly probable, but I do not say it to offend anybody. Listen, Abba, it's Aramaic, not Arabic, Aramaic one of the oldest languages in the world. Jesus spoke often in Aramaic. All right? Sometimes Hebrew, sometimes Greek. Aramaic. When he says, or when the Bible says Abba, it's rooted in the Aramaic. It's been adopted by the Greek. It's been adopted by the Hebrew. It's been adopted... Uh, In other cultures, the verbiage, I've told you before, the cutest, most uh, applicable is what Italian uh, would would say of of, uh, dad. It's papa. Here's where the offense comes. Somebody's now leaping for their TV set to turn it off because they think that's offensive. That the believer is to call God, papa, abba. In Aramaic. There's no closer term. This is the Bible. The Apostle Paul. The Jew of Jews. The Hebrew of Hebrews. The Apostle Paul. The greatest Jew that's ever lived outside of Christ. Think of that. If you think about it. Certainly the greatest convert to Christianity. Hands down. And he's the one who says, wait a minute. As the Spirit of God moved upon him... The understanding of the Old Testament scriptures brought Paul to this conclusion. Those who are in the family of God with believing Abraham refer to God no longer as some distant deity, but Abba, Father. And if you're Italian, the word is Papa. What a tender thing. If you've ever been to Israel or if you're Jewish today, I love being in Israel, especially with all of you, and you'll hear the kids running down the street and they'll be yelling for their dad. And what do you hear them yelling? Abba, Abba. And, and you go, I know that. That's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. <laughs> yes, you're correct. This is a little boy calling out or a little girl calling out to their daddy. And right here in the Bible, God is saying to you, You're my child, you're my son, you're my daughter. And your response back is to cry out to him, Abba. Don't just talk about it. God this, God that, the Lord this, the Lord this, Jesus this, Jesus that. Hey, listen, it better be personal. When his name comes off of your lips, it ought to be tender and sweet, Christian. It's the ultimate relationship. That one that you're lacking in this world, he's got for you right here, right now. And he says, call me Abba. Jesus referred to the Father in his prayers and in his teaching as Abba. And that offended a lot of the Jewish listeners because they wanted the distance between who they are and who God is. You got to put God up and away somewhere. People do that, listen, in religion. People do that, listen, people do that here sometimes. I have to tell people, I'm not kidding. People will come and they'll say, Father Jack. No, I'm serious. And I said, stop right there. (laughs) Look over here. The Bible says in Matthew's gospel, Jesus said, call no man on earth father. For you have only one father and that is he who is in heaven. I've been called priest. I was introduced recently as a reverend. I want you to keep that in mind from time to time. (laughs) 
say it meaning this, the Lord has called me, called you his own. He's called you his own. <laughs> For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Running through the meaning of these words, I want to get to the conclusion of this. Look at the word receive, very powerful. Receive. Receive means to pick up and or to take up into one's heart. Accepting, to catch or to have caught something or someone receive. You did not receive the spirit again of fear. The Christian is forbidden to be fearful. There's no reason for it. It's silly. But look at this. It's what we did not receive, and that is the spirit of bondage. Next word, bondage is this. A self-induced slavery. Listen, this is, this is very, very disturbing in our modern age. A self-induced slavery, placing yourself in the place of a, or situation of being a slave or to be under the control of another. This is the, this is the goal of a narcissist to, regarding those in their lives. A narcissist is manifesting certainly what has fallen in nature, and it certainly may even be an attribute of, of satanic influence, to get you, one who has been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, you who trust him, your name is written down in heaven, you've been liberated and set free, God looks on you and sees no mark upon you, he sees you according to the Bible, as perfect as his son Jesus is, that's all Bible. Yet there are some believers who are under a self-induced slavery. They've placed themselves in some place or situation of being a slave or under the control of another or something else. And listen, you need to know, that's not from God. He doesn't do this. Take this and do the opposite regarding Christ. Christ. And the word fear, you actually know this word, phobos. You ever, can you go, can you know where I'm going with this? Phobos, Greek, phobos, phobia. To be put to flight or to run in terror, to be in dread, terror, to be fearful and in a state of intimidation. Satan loves this. Are you in a state of fear? He loves that. He loves to keep you scared, fearful. Listen, child of God, son and daughter of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, you now need to say, Lord, set me free from the fear that encroaches upon my life. Amen. Is it a boss? Is it a person? Is it a situation? Is it time itself? Are you prone to worry? Listen, you need to say, God, here's my worry, and give it to him. And watch how he shifts now into the positive. And it's the word cry. Cry. Krazo is the word in Greek, and it means this, to shout out or to scream, to cry out with a loud voice, to be crying. This is loud. Listen to this. We cry out with a loud voice, Abba. It implies, watch, it implies fear is coming at, are you guys with me, everybody? Fear is coming after me. Something's coming after me. It's coming. And you're running. You can just watch a little kid when something scares them. They drop what they're doing and they run straight to mom or dad. And they might even be yelling out, Abba, Abba. <laughs> now, you know what God doesn't do? He doesn't start running when you start running to him. He also doesn't turn around and plant himself and hold you back from getting near him. I think one of the most beautiful, beautiful manifestations of how our walk ought to be with God is when you see a two-year-old latch on to mom or dad's knee when they're scared or terrified about something. Or when I was growing up, when something was really bad, I would say I was a scared. <laughs> a scared is really bad. 
that is being scared and afraid compounded, a scared. When I was a scared, I ran and grabbed on. God expects you to come and grab on and hang on. This week, um, there was a situation with uh, a friend of mine and her dad had experienced a, a very, very critical heart issue and close to not living, close to not surviving. And uh, imme immediately she texts me. She lives in another state. And she immediately texts me. And I said, I'm praying now and I'm sending it to our prayer team. And I copied it and I sent it to the prayer team. And then the whole week, I just simply said, how's he doing? Give me updates. And it was, well, he survived the night. Well, uh, he's doing this. Uh, he's breathing on his own. He's the, and, and as the week went on, this family was put through the ringer, and yet God walked them through it. And the last text I saw yesterday was everybody saying this has just been a miraculous time. Listen, no matter how it ends, by the way, this family, they're all believers, and they all uh, watch on, online here. Uh, but just know this. What if it went the other way? God is still perfectly God. God is still perfectly good. God has still done perfectly what is best. Though we may not understand, God does what's exactly best. In the positive, we cry out to him no matter what. You need to check the basis, friend, in your game and ask yourself, when, when somebody, so to speak, situation smack you upside the face, where do you run? Where do you run? I do, I do now believe part of the preparation for this ministry were the years, 13 years I worked for uh, Baxter Healthcare, Edwards Division, down by John Wayne Airport. And I, uh, to this day, I, have, I, have no, I just cannot thank God enough for putting me in a situation like that because I worked with a bunch of brainiacs who didn't believe God. They didn't believe in God. But they knew I did. So it seemed like every weekend on Monday morning, they would come with some new question for me. <laughs> really, it was absolutely amazing. It was fun. And it was, listen, it wasn't that I was smarter than them. My God was smarter than them. Yeah. And they would ask me, so what do you think about this? And I could just see them all weekend long with their friends. What, what are we going to do? <laughs> and um, I just remember saying, you know, God, I don't even belong, you know, in, in this corporation and, the, and what I'm doing. And this is amazing, God, and thank you. And, uh, but you need to give me the mouth of Stephen. Remember the mouth of Stephen in the book of Acts? Stephen spoke in such a way under the Holy Spirit's power that nobody could refute what he was saying. So they got so mad, they stoned him to death. So I only quoted part of that verse to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> and... and um, I got to tell you, I would simply say, I'd, I'd go to the rock. I'd just go to the rock. They would ask me a question. I would say, well, the Bible says this. And that would so frustrate them. But what do you believe? That's what I believe. Oh, so you believe the Bible? Yes. Here's where they come back. That's ridiculous. When they say that, say, why? Why is it ridiculous? And then they're going to tell you what they believe in. Let them tell you. Just when they're all done, shake their hand. Say, dude, I'm impressed. That knucklehead story you just told about what you believe in, you've got way more faith than I do. <laughs> Everyone believes in something or someone. The question is, who is it? And what is it? In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15, the Bible says, but the Holy Spirit also bears witness with us. Isn't that awesome? For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. God, God first promised that to the Jews and secondly to any or all who would believe, Gentiles, all of us. This is an absolutely beautiful, remarkable truth of God. Listen to Galatians chapter four, verse six. And because you are sons... God has set forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. 
And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Isn't that awesome? So here's where we begin to end this here. Adoption. Pick it up next time. Adoption. Paul, everybody, this is so fantastic. Judaism does not believe in adoption. You will not find adoption in the Old Testament. Not going to find it. Adoption. In Jewish theology, it's birth, it's blood. It's blood rights. It's name rights. Are you, is your last name Levi or Cohen? Are you a Kohathite or a Levite? What's your bloodline? Paul, the consummate Jew, who knew all this and could argue it perfectly, winds up getting saved by the power of God, meeting Christ Jesus on that road to Damascus, and begins to be taught by Christ the relationship that every true believer must have with God, and it's not by birth. It's by adoption. You have to be adopted. I read. The Roman law of adoption and inheritance. The founding father of the Roman Empire was the man Julius Caesar. Now as Caesars go, we have all heard of him, but what we might not remember is that at the time of Julius Caesar's death, he had no heir to receive his throne or his wealth. But that didn't keep Julius Caesar from taking care of business. Julius Caesar exercised the Roman right of adoption. A Roman adoption placed one single individual into the full status of being the sole heir of all that the pater, P-A-T-E-R, have you heard that before, pater? Uh, it's root word to patriarch or paternal or head who owns who who upon his death at his death his will was opened and in it was this declaration by caesar by the right or by the roman right of adoption that gaius octavius would become his only son and heir by the roman law of adoption. At the moment of the announcement being made, Gaius Octavius was summoned. He didn't even know. He was summoned and in a moment of time was given a new name. The new name was Caesar Augustus. Normally at the Roman Forum, a legal transaction would take place that required the patron, Julius Caesar, who would publicly proclaim, this is my only son. He could have 10 natural born blood sons. Are you with me, everybody? But it's his sovereign choice to choose who he leaves the empire to. And as Caesar surveyed, he decided this one, this kid I know, it goes to him. And Octavius became Caesar Augustus. And if Caesar, Julius Caesar wouldn't have died, it would have gone the normal way, which is this way. This is my only son. It had to be said at the forum in Rome before seven eyewitnesses. The eyewitnesses had to be younger than Julius Caesar so that over time, they would all say the same thing about this person being the only son. I leave you with this. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River and came up out of the water and God the Father says, this is my only son. Over and over again, God the Father would say, this is my only son, this is my son, this is my son, hear him, this is my son, believe in him, this is my only son, this is my only son. God says to you today, you are my only daughter, you are my only son, exclusive. 
This is perfectly built off the Old Testament doctrine that if Adam and Eve had one child only and no one else, Christ still would have come and died for that family of three. It's not, a, it's not about numbers. It's about you and him. Is that amazing? You want, to know how, you want to know how wealthy you are and how valued you are? That if you're the only child of Adam and Eve, God would have still come and died for your sins. That's a theological fact. Now that ought to, that ought to put something in your tank, you know? Amen. Father, we thank you that your Bible tells us that you have adopted us into the family of God. We praise you, Lord, for your goodness, and we thank you, Father, for your generosity. And so, Lord God, we pray that today we would live, act, talk, walk, be sons and daughters of God. We've been adopted, chosen, and all of which you have bestowed upon your son, your Bible tells us you've bestowed upon us. So, Father, we pray now for your touch. May we go from this building today blessing heaven and being a terror to hell. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Church, let's stand together. And I just want to encourage you, church, that the Lord bless you this week and the Lord fill you with his Holy Spirit. God watch over you and keep you. And this is my blessing I pray upon both my family and your family that all this week, no matter what's going on in your week, that we are very attentive to his voice, what he is saying, how he is guiding us, and that we are looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys.